Charles School District on Thursday, December 6th, 2018. Uh, now calls to order the organizational meeting. Uh, can we start with a uh, moment of silence and followed by the Pledge of Allegiance? Um, what you want to do now is um, accept nominations for the temporary president mm -hmm. and nominations do not have to be second so you want to open the floor to nominations mm -hmm. for temporary president All right, I'll, I'll nominate Tim Skiff. is there a motion to close nominations moved and seconded I'll make a motion to close second all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All those in favor of um, Mr. Scaife say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now you want to, you're in charge and you go to <coughs> nominations for president of the board for this year. <coughs> okay. Um, do I have nominations to elect the president? I nominate Chris Johnson. Second. Okay. Do I have a motion to close the nominations? I'll make a motion to close. Okay. Uh, by Mr. Elkin. So moved. Second by uh, Mr. Mulroy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All those in favor of closing nominations? Uh, aye, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh. Okay, all those in favor of Mr. Chauncey, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Mr. Chauncey will be uh, president. Uh, next, we have uh, nominations for vice president. Do I have any nominations for vice president? Nominate Dr. Lobby. Second. <coughs> Any other nominations? Do I have a motion to close, motion to close nominations? Closed. No moves. Okay, Mr. Mulroy. I'll second it. Second by uh, Mr. Elkin. Uh, all those in favor of closing nominations, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> all those okay. in favor of Dr. All those in favor of Dr. Lobby, your vice president, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Okay, Dr. Lobby has been uh, voted in as vice president. Uh, term of office of uh, Ms. Tracy Bowser on the Joint Operating Committee of Lenape Area Votech uh, School Committee will expire in December 2018. Uh, she has uh, agreed to serve again, so the Board of uh, school directors of Armstrong School District uh, elects Tracy Bowser to serve on the nomination. Or, you, know, you can go ahead. Okay. The way doing it. To serve on the Lenape Area of Vocational <coughs> School Joint Operating Committee for three-year term ending December 2021. Can I have a, a motion to uh, elect her? Motion. Second. All those in favor of electing Ms. Bowser, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the six board members not serving on the joint operating committee will be altern alternate representatives during 2019. <laughs> 
And that's pursuant to Lenape and Armstrong School District's policy. All right, I think that ends our uh, reorganizational meeting, so. You, you want to do, the last thing you have to do for these items would be to set your um, schedule of meetings for the coming year. And then you can see in front of you what the schedule is, and it would be following the same as you have done in the past. So you would need a motion second to keep that schedule. Okay, do we have a, a motion to uh, approve the schedule as uh, is in front of you for 2019, uh, keeping uh, the same basic schedule as we have had this year? Well, there's two months that uh, it's different. June, because of the budget, we push it back uh, a week. In uh, November, due to Veterans Day, we push it back a week. That's typically how, how we've done it. I'll make a motion. Okay, motion by Mr. Verdell. I'll second it. Second by Mr. Elkin. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Do I have a motion to adjourn the uh, organizational meeting? So moved. Okay, motion by Mr. Mulroy. Second. Second by Mr. Rudell. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the motion is, or meeting is adjourned. Still have to do roll call. Pledge of allegiance. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the uh, open caucus meeting for the Armstrong School District on. Uh, Thursday, find the date. Uh, December 6th. Uh, so we will now call that meeting to order. Uh, can we have roll call? Mr. Burdell? Here. Ms. Bowser? Mr. Chonsick? Mr. Elkin? Here. Ms. Lote? Dr. Lobby? Mr. Mulroy? Here. Mr. Skate? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Hmm? The Board of School Directors of Armstrong School District convened an executive session on Thursday, <coughs> December 6th at 6.45 p.m. in the faculty lounge of West Hills Intermediate School in Katani for discussion of personnel, real estate, student confidentiality, and a legal claim involving a negligence claim. Okay, uh, first section here is reports. So we have a uh, student representative from Armstrong Junior Senior High School. Okay, so first we'll, I'll do West Hills, and the West Hills primary is first, and they participated in a penny war, which is where the teachers carved pumpkins, and the students could bring in pennies to put in a jar for their favorite one, and any silver coins or dollars that were put into the jar was subtracted from the total, and whichever pumpkin had the most money at the end won. Um, the money was donated to the Salvation Army for Thanksgiving dinners and for local families, and they raised over $1,000. Um, on November 8th, the West Hills Primary honored veterans by participating in the Parade of Flags. The students dressed in red, white, and blue, and they joined in the gym of singing, for singing of patriotic songs and paraded around the building carrying flags. The AHS Chorus will visit West Hills Intermediate for a holiday concert for students from the West Hills Primary and West Hills Intermediate. The PTO is sponsoring a movie night at West Hills Primary for families on December 14th. Also on December 14th, third grade students will be dressed as Who's from Whoville as they celebrate Grinch Day, and the second graders will, will be participating in reindeer games. The second grade <coughs> students will be performing a holiday show for families on December 19th at 1.45. <coughs> on December 20th, the first graders will be wearing their PJs as they settle for a ride in the Polar Express, and December activities will end with Christmas parties on December 23rd with carol singing beginning at 9 a.m. For West Hills Intermediate, Veterans Day program was a success. They had about 100 veterans and their guests. There was also a food drive, which went, resulting in 1,500 items for the Veterans Nursing Home Facility. 
On December 3rd, there was a PTO meeting. The, on December 22nd will be the Christmas parties. On December 6th and 12th will be math professional development visit from CMU um, Learn Lab to help the students. On December 13th, the Armstrong High School Chorus will perform. The 14th is also PTO movie night. On December 12th, the Drug and Alcohol Commission is to complete a 10 session 10 session workshop with sixth grade students. Numerous STEM activities are in progress and are underway. And on January 7th, Acronauts is to <coughs> present engineering and rocketry. rocketry. Um, from Lenape, fire prevention assemblies took place. The Manor Township Fire Department came to the school and showed students grades kindergarten through sixth about their gear and they got to see inside a fire truck. The fifth and sixth grade movie reward was a success. The students in fifth and sixth grade celebrated good behavior and academic success by holding a movie day that included popcorn and movie snacks. PTO just finished up quarters for Christmas. The school was able to raise over $3,500 for Lenape families in need during the Christmas season um, where they collected quarters and that was like the main gist of it. The Fort City Falcons Club donated 1400s to that fund. Veterans Day assembly was hosted, and the assembly honored over 100 veterans. The students read essays, sang songs, and performed a flag folding. After the assemblies, the PTO provided a nice lunch for the veterans and their families. Wellness Day, students participated in a school-wide wellness activity promoting active lifestyles. Kindergarten Thanksgiving feast, um, the kindergarten celebrated Thanksgiving with a feast of their own, and the Hawk Award Drawing A's, part of our PBIS plan, or students who received Hawk tickets were drawn and prizes were given for their exemplary behaviors. For the high school, the chorus concert is being held tonight, and the band concert will be held on December 19th. Isabel Valasek, who is in um, the choir, qualified for the All Eastern Choir. The girls' volleyball won their fourth section title in a row. Winter sports are underway. They include girls and boys basketball, wrestling, swimming, rifle, bowling, and hockey. Veterans Day Assembly was held at AHS and it was sponsored by National Honor Society and Key Club. Veterans spoke and the band and chorus performed. 43 vets were in attendance. Um, NHS will be sponsoring a blood drive on December 18th. The Leo Club teamed up with Life Skills and the Salvation Army to do a food drive that brought in 1,686 items. They are also sponsoring a toy drive going in hand with the Ford City Lions to donate the toys to Salvation Army. And Interact Club um, raised money for cancer patients in the area by selling plaques and hearts for people in honor or in memory of loved ones or anyone that they know who had cancer and all money raised will go to cancer patients. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Central Office Administrative Report. Yeah, we have a number of uh, <clears throat> presentations to come before the board this evening. We'll start with uh, real quick with Mr. Rummel. And he's returning. He was here, I believe, in October to talk about junior high baseball softball. He was asked to get back and bring the board some additional information regarding some questions that we had. He's here to report back to the board regarding those requests. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, we got, um, as uh, Mr. DeVivo stated, a couple months ago I made a presentation to start uh, junior high baseball and softball at Armstrong High School. And we did a cost analysis for you and in depth on how the cost would be to start the program up and also how we'd pay for it. So uh, I believe you probably have that. And, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. It's in the uh, information. Uh, folder under junior high baseball softball cost analysis. <coughs> How many games have you planned, Mr. Ryan? We're, we're looking anywhere between, uh, Mr. Burdell, probably between 8 and 12 is what we're looking at. Uh, the softball coach told me yesterday 
he just he doesn't care if there's even four or five games. They just want to get the kids practicing and get it started sure. this year. So that's what we're looking at. But uh, optimistically, probably 12 games, a low end, probably six to eight. A lot of uh, interest in it? Uh, that, that's what I'm hearing. We didn't do a formal interest level because from past history, kids just sign up with the buddies and that. But from talking to the coaches and that, and they're all gung-ho and ready to go with this. So I'm sure if you don't get the interest, you'll have to take Absolutely. The yeah. Sure. It's just a pilot program. We hope it makes it. And as I said uh, two months ago, everyone in our sections has it. Okay. So okay. it basically gives us a – it puts our kids on equal playing ground once they get to the varsity level. So that's the way we're looking at it. Mr. Rommel, you said uh, most of the equipment will come from the varsity. That's correct. Now, uh, does that include helmets? That's correct. So you have six extra baseball helmets minimum and six extra softball helmets. The, the standard thing now is, believe it or not, kids, a lot of kids have their own helmets, so we're seeing, but we do have a surplus of, of helmets, so that okay. wouldn't be a cost that we need to take under. Okay, what about catching equipment? We have that as well. Now, a, a eighth grade catcher is going to be considerably smaller than a senior catcher. Do you agree? Possibly. We have the, we have the correct equipment. That's correct. We have I'm going the, with my coaches, what they're telling me. So that's the information I'm going with. And we so. have extra catching helmets, extra bats. We've got the whole ball of uh, Every kid brings their own bat. And that's, that's just the way society. It's not like it when we played where you had one bat and the whole team used it. So. Yeah, if I could speak, Ms. Smith, most a bat nowadays is anywhere from three to four hundred dollars. School districts aren't buying those bats yeah. anymore. These kids are carrying around at least two or three in their bags. Yes. Minimal. They have their own helmet. If you're a catcher, you have your own gear. Yes. Uh, schools usually do buy maybe a set of catch gear or two, but by now it's been three years. I'm sure the varsity's passing it down. Correct. And there's not a whole lot of equipment you buy anymore. They're buying their own. And your, your, uh, your transportation estimates, that goes by the district, so much a mile, so many hours, et cetera. Right? That's correct. The district procedure. That's correct. And uh, I gave you uh, each school that we potentially would be right. playing and the okay. cost for each one. And you want, to, you want to do that this year, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> What do, you, what do you need approval? I'd like to, Mr. DeVivo, as soon as possible so my guys can start putting a schedule together. Okay, can we have consensus to uh, put the approval of this program on, on the <clears throat> meeting on Monday? Yes. 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 Okay. There is consensus. We will put it on the agenda for Monday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, we have rounds here this evening. Rob Strickland to do a follow-up on our two projects at Shannon Valley Elementary in Elberton over the summer, and also get into uh, Dayton air conditioning and some security vestibules, both at Dayton and West Hills. Rob, welcome back. Thank you. Seems like an odd evening to be talking about uh, air conditioning at another building, but um, nonetheless, here we are. Uh, I did want to just take a couple minutes and, and show you some pictures of the projects that we've completed over the last two summers at Shannock Valley and Elderton. Not sure if, if everybody's had a chance to get out there and see them, but they are uh, pretty, pretty dramatic looking. So go ahead. You can just jump through them. So here's the exterior at, at Shannock Valley. Um, I mean, I, I, I think we probably showed you this previously, but we stripped the entire skin off the building um, in the summer. Came in with, with new curtain wall, new uh, metal panels on the side there. Then uh, on the far, far picture there, that's, the, that's a classroom. New paint, new flooring, lighting upgrades, uh, the windows, uh, everything. So. Uh, Pretty dramatic change there as well. Here's just a picture of some of the equipment we installed, uh, the chiller and the new boilers, uh, providing the new HVAC. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. And then uh, here is, is the reconfiguration of the office. 
to accommodate the secure vestibule. Um, so you'll see the, the far picture is the, is the office that we totally uh, reconfigured and renovated, and then we have the man trap uh, here with, with, uh, for the secure entrance vestibule. <coughs> Here's the gym. Um, this past summer we came into the gym here. We did paint um, and then the library. Uh, we had not touched the library previously because of the uh, vinyl asbestos floor tile. We took all that out. You see the new carpet. Um, again, fresh coat of paint throughout and, and uh, both in both areas there. So I'm not going to read down through this. This is the scope of work that we accomplished, but um, it was a pretty significant job uh, over uh, two summers there. So uh, on to Elderton. Um, the biggest thing is when you go there, you know where the main entrance is, where you're supposed to be going in. I, I think that's, it's not you know, a big grand entrance, but it, it gives you an indication of where you're supposed to go. So I, I think that turned out pretty well. Uh, there you see the cafeteria. New, new paint, lighting, um, the flooring there, I don't think we replaced uh, in the cafeteria that, that stayed. Go ahead. Here's the, the new equipment there. Again, you'll, you'll notice that the, the boilers and the chillers look very much as, uh, the same as to what we put into the Shannock Valley project, and that was intentional. We keep everything standardized as best we can, makes it a little easier on your maintenance staff. And then the picture in the middle is the, is the new uh, emergency generator. Uh, here again, classroom, corridor, um, I, I just, when we came through here, uh, it was just maybe a month ago or so to take some of these pictures, um, and this was the first time I had been back into Elderton since we completed everything. The, 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 the feeling when you enter the building, it's so much brighter and more welcoming. Um, it was just a really dark, drab building and corridors and everything. It made a big difference, I think. Um, so, but again, you know, similar. New ceiling tile, new lights, um, paint, flooring, I think, in the classrooms there. Uh, go ahead. Uh, here, kitchen down on the far end. Uh, we did a lot of work in the kitchen this summer. We took out several hoods, moved equipment around, put in new equipment. And then the picture closer to me here is the secure entrance between the elementary school and the high school area. Um, this is a big step up from the plywood door that had been there before. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a real, you know, secured entrance now. You see the key swipe card access there. Uh, something that is on the list here that, no, that's okay, you can go. Uh, that, that's on the list here but not shown in the pictures. Uh, we did the new roof on the elementary school section there as well. Uh, so again, another significant project that we accomplished. And I, I think they turned out very well. I hope you all feel the same way. We're very pleased with how they, uh, they turned out. but. Um, hope to be able to do some more work with you here moving forward. If so, I just add in, I think Mr. Hooks and Dr. Jim Cole would agree that for the most part, you know, these last two summers, uh, even though there has been major renovations going on, there was very little disturbance. Things went very smoothly for the most part. Um, worked very well with our, their staff, get the rooms cleared, get them all set back up again. Uh, we do meet, uh, I believe it's quarterly or semi-annually with his energy team mm -hmm. to make sure that the energy Initiatives that they put in to save us uh, money, we need to, to review that and make sure we're following the recommendations that they did and that they're you know, sticking to the estimates that they had. So um, as for the last two summers, construction is never fun, but at least this one wasn't too painful. Yep, and that's, that's one of the real benefits of, of this program. To accomplish renovations like this in a traditional design bid build project, you know, you're looking at a 12-month occupied renovation where you're having to move kids around your building as you're trying to renovate classrooms. Um, and, and to do the heating and cooling, you know, you have to try and squeeze that into the summer. But we're, we were able to compress all of that and get these projects done over the summer, uh, thus avoiding all of that educational disruption. So, um, Dayton Elementary School. Uh, we understand that there is um, some desire for cooling there. Uh, so we took a look at that building. Um, one of the things that we <coughs> have done in other projects that we did as components of the previous two projects is we installed what's called a dedicated outside air system. Um, some people call it air conditioning light. I'm not really comfortable with that term. It is a level of air conditioning, but it is not full air conditioning. So what we do is 
uh, as with the previous two buildings, we decouple the heating and cooling from the outside air. So right now, um, this unit back here, it's a unit ventilator. It's got an opening to the outside. It pulls all the fresh air in through there, and then it runs it through either the heating or the cooling coils, right? So at Dayton, you don't have any cooling coils. You just have heating coils. So with this type of system, we would block off the outside air opening there. So now it's just a fan blowing air over heating coils, and we install rooftop units and ductwork that provides the fresh air. But as part of that system, there is some level of air conditioning. Now, let's say a building the size of Dayton would require, I don't know, 100 tons of cooling for full air conditioning. We would install maybe 40 or 50, okay? So we're not able to cool the building the whole way down to 70 or 72 degrees. We're able to cool it down to 74 or 75. But with bringing it down to 74 or 75 degrees, we're pulling all the humidity out of the air before it comes into the classroom. And it's done a fantastic job of cooling elementary schools, very similar to Dayton, at a fraction of the cost. Uh, we've completed, uh, just this past summer, a project at Juniata Valley School District uh, at their elementary school where we did this exact same project. We've done it uh, previously for Woodland Hills, for Mifflin County School District, uh, St. Clair Area School District. So we've done it in a number of places and it's been very successful. Now, when you have days where it's 99 degrees outside or 100 degrees, it's going to still feel warm, but it's going to be a dry room, you know. So it's not that oppressing heat and humidity. It's going to be maybe 76, 77 degrees, but it's going to be a whole lot better than it was before. And the benefit here is you're accomplishing it at a significant cost savings. But, and, and we, we explained this to Mr. DeVivo and Mr. Kirk, if we do this and you're not satisfied, you decide you want full air conditioning, you haven't wasted your money by doing this. Because this is what we did in the previous buildings also. You would have this dedicated outside air system and you could couple it up with a full chilled water system. So you could come back at another time then and say, all right, we want to do the chilled water uh, here as well. So really here what we're doing is we're, we're going to put in the, we would recommend putting in the dedicated outside air system. Um, replace the existing multi-purpose room air handler and add actual DX cooling, full air conditioning there in the multi-purpose room. Um, add DX cooling to the library rooftop unit. Um, replace the, the uh, air handler uh, that serves the music room um, and, and put the DX cooling in there. Put in a new DDC or you know modern control system and hook, hook it up so that it all of the new equipment is fully controlled by the DDC system, and all of the existing equipment that is currently on pneumatics would be controlled by the DDC, but it would be limited controls. Uh, and again, you don't want to put brand new sophisticated controls on old equipment. It's just, it's not a, a wise use of, uh, not a wise investment. So, go ahead, Chris. Security, uh, we understand you know, the desire is there to have a secure vestibule, uh, just like we've done in other buildings. So um, as you can see, I have a floor plan here. Right here's your main entrance. What we're proposing, and we haven't quite figured it out yet, is whether we punch something through here and are able to keep the, the second set of doors here and the, kids go, or the, the visitors go out that way, or if we square this off again, move this set of doors back, and then have, it, have an entrance in here. We're not exactly sure, but some, something like that to accomplish that uh, secure vestibule entrance again. A um, couple alternates for consideration. Uh, com replacing the uh, air handlers that serve the computer lab and the office. Those are you know, getting up there in age. They seem to be working very well right now, but something to consider. Um, as I said, the DDC, we could if you, would, if you would like us to, remove the existing pneumatic controls and install it throughout the rest of the building. Um, converting the lighting over to LED as we've done in other buildings. And then the last alternate is the, is the big one and that's installing the full chilled water air conditioning system. Uh, again, this is at West Shimokin. The desire is for a secure vestibule. Um, you've got everything set up very well for it here with the two sets of doors. 
really just need to create an entryway into the office through this wall here. Uh, I think that would be a pretty easy job to accomplish. So that would be the uh, uh, scope of work there at West Shimokin. So just some, some estimates on cost. You know, if we look at all of this, we're looking at, at a little more than $1.6 million. Um, and as it has been in, in the past, it, that includes all costs, whether it's architectural, engineering, you know, the, the construction costs. Again, there's no change orders, all of the inspections. So all of those items are rolled in, up into that cost, again, just as we've done in the past. And then lastly, some estimates on those alternates. You'll see the, uh, the computer and, and um, office air handlers, the pneumatics, uh, the LED lighting, and the, the chilled water system. So, um, Rob, just to be clear, to add the chilled water, it would be the additional 2.1, correct? Yes, sir. On top of the dehumidification system you're recommending? Yes, sir. And again, this is a, we always try to present a worst case scenario. I'd like to come in here and tell you it's, you know, $2.1 million and then on bid day it's 1.9 or something. I, I don't want to go the other way. I hate doing that. So we try to be a little bit conservative. And our engineers were trying to figure out some different ways to accomplish this that might save some money off there, a couple hundred thousand. And they've got some ideas, but until we get further into engineering, we're not comfortable putting it out there as a as a real cost item yet. <coughs> so we'd like it to be under on bid day as well. I I totally understand that. So far you've been two for two. That's right. I'd like to stay that way. So that's my presentation. If there are questions, I'm I'm happy to try and answer them. Can you talk about just the next steps if we're gonna proceed, you know, about how we have to get do the RFP sure. approve at that level then right. you want to just talk because so, we've done this the last two years, but mm -hmm. just to refer to bring the board up to yeah. speed. So the, the last two projects were accomplished as guaranteed energy savings agreements. And as part of that, we had signed an investment grade audit agreement with the district that only listed two buildings. It only listed Shannock Valley and Elderton. And because the, that initial contract listed those two buildings, we're limited to only working in those buildings under, those co under that contract. So we would have to re-advertise collect proposals, the district would have to collect proposals again, make a selection, and then go through the investment grade audit process again. Um, I laid out a schedule for Mr. Kirk. We could do that and have um, everything you know, wrapped up in February. We could be back here in March then with uh, pricing for whatever scope of work you, you've determined you, you would like us to accomplish. Any questions for Mr. Strickler? Yes. Uh, does Dayton's electrical system handle this? Most As definitely. Is. Most definitely. Dayton's electrical system is built for a building about two times the size of what you have there. Okay. Is there any other uh, hidden thing that uh, would be? Nothing that we're aware of at this point in time. No. I mean, there's not going to be any plumbing. Uh, we we did not. We weren't tasked to look at any plumbing changes or anything. Um, you know, any plumbing associated with this scope is all included in there. So, but nothing as far as like we're not looking at the domestic hot water system or or the boilers or anything like that. And Dayton's roof. Dayton's roof. Um, we do not have that in there. I I no. don't. I, don't, I, think, I think the roof was in pretty good condition yeah, the when we were up there. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly how much years are left on that, but the two things we asked them to look at was the air as well as uh, the secured vestibule. Um, we've been out to date lately. I, that building is in very good shape, uh, except for those couple areas. So um, it's, it's a very good, very nice building. If you get back 1.6 for the air, and what was for the vestibule? Um, the vestibule, I think, I, yeah, I, I didn't have them broken up in here, but I think the secured vestibule was about two. Take it back to the one. There you go. Yeah, I, I think the secure vestibule broken out was around two hundred and twenty thousand. That's part of the one five eight seven. Right, right. He, he doesn't have broken out. The estimate he gave us somewhere was around between two hundred two hundred fifty thousand. So we included that in our Act forty four security grant. Which we don't know whether or not we'll get, but we did include that. So if we got those funds, those funds would go towards. <coughs> Paying them to do the secure vestibule. 
And then the other secure vestibule at West Shemokin is the 537. Yeah. Which is down below that. Right. So that's, that's approximately the same price as Elder Security. Uh, no. No. The, the, the jobs at Elderton, because it, it included having to reconfigure the office a lot more extensively, was, was higher to do that work, to do the secure vestibules there. Because there was a lot. There was a lot. Well, no, uh, I'm sorry. Shannock Valley was the bigger. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If any questions come up, let Mr. Kirk know. He knows how to get a hold of us. We'll get you answers as quickly as we can. All right. Thank you. Have a, have a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Safe drive. Careful. Uh, the last uh, presentation from the board this evening is our Central Office Administrator, Dr. Glenn, and Dr. Siloski, and all the other level administrators to uh, detail and highlight uh, student achievement data for the course of last year. Uh, to Dr. Williams and Dr. Siloski. <laughs> Keep you, have a, you have a copy of the presentation under central office reports on the agenda. First slide there, Chris. Uh, you may recall or have been familiar. I think traditionally here we presented state assessment results and, and we are going to have the principals do that tonight. Um, up until this year, the school evaluation platform was called the school performance profile in which, you know, every school was assigned and you got a number. Um, you might recall last year, I think I reported, was happy to report that, you know, every school in the district had made uh, the proficient status based on that number. When No Child Left Behind was replaced by the Every Student Succeeds Act, so too the state started about replacing the school performance profile platform. Um, and that has you know, kind of begun this year, uh, and it's called the Future Ready Index. Um, the website for it is futureadypa.org. Uh, some of the same things, some things different. Uh, with this iteration, uh, the state sought to met requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, by establishing long-term goals for growth, long-term goals for improving proficiency on assessments, long-term goals, goals for improving graduation rate, uh, again, long-term goals for improving attendance rate. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania also chose to add nine other indicators to that. For tonight's purposes and for brevity's sake, we ask the principals to kind of focus on what we have in the past, um, which is assessment data, growth data, proficiency data, um, and that really makes up five of the 13 indicators. Um, but before we turn things over to them, Dr. Slosky and I wanted to, to kind of review uh, the 13 indicators under the new Future Ready Index platform, just so you're familiar with them, and, you know, and then you have uh, the website there to, to be able to check that out. Thank you. Yes, and as Dr. Williams said, the purpose of the Future Ready Index was the state wanted to expand the way that schools in the state of Pennsylvania were deemed effective. So the old system was really heavily focused on student achievement. This new Future Ready system has 11 indicators, and many of which are new. But the indicators are clustered under three main categories. The first category is the statewide assessment measures, and as in the past, our assessment measure is determined on the percent of students who are proficient or advanced on either PSSA or Keystone exams in the English language arts, math or algebra, or science or biology. The second consideration is the percent of our students who scored advanced in those very same content areas based on PSSA and Keystone <coughs> exams. And the third indicator, which is really the one that we focus a lot on in terms of our instructional planning, is called PBOS. And it's basically a growth measure. What the state does, they take groups of students and they basically measure how much they have grown during the course of a school year. 
based on a formula that they have. And from that information, we can take groups of students to determine did they exceed the expected amount of growth in a particular year, or did they not? Or did, you, did we meet the expectation for the state? So our teachers and our administrative staff spend a lot of time going through that PBOS data to determine how effective we were in technically growing children, growing students over the course of the year. Anything you wanted to add about this? Well, the PBOS, and I've said this at this presentation in the past, that, that is you know, where we spend a, a fair amount of time and a lot of emphasis, mm -hmm. uh, mostly for the point that that's about helping kids reach their potential. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's the child measured against themselves based on past test scores. Um, it's not an unrealistic bar for them to achieve. Um, so that's, you know, at least for, for me looking at that, it's, it's all important, but that's more important than, than proficiency. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, at, at, a, at a given test subject, at a given grade level, uh, 50 to 60 percent of our kids are projected to not reach proficiency on the test. Um, you know, and, and that doesn't mean we're not working with them. Um, we do everything we can and we provide interventions in that regard. Ahead, yeah, the second category is called on-track measures. There are three on-track measures, the first of which is the gauging of the language proficiency level of English learners, ELs. In our district, we currently have 12 students, uh, K to 12, that receive ESL services. Um, and each year, they take an access test, which is a language proficiency test. So the state gathers that data and that information to determine how are we doing with regards to not only their performance on the PSSA, but are we gaining proficiency with regards to their ability to acquire and use the English language in all four modalities, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So the state is also gathering that kind of information for us as well. And obviously another on-track measure, which is something that's been in the past, is attendance. They gather information with regards to our attendance rates um, regarding Keystone exams and PSSA. Early indicators of success. The state has determined that basically uh, third grade reading and seventh grade math are indicators of future success for a student. So if a, if a child scores proficient or advanced in third grade reading, the chances are pretty great that that child is going to continue on and be successful because they scored proficient or advanced in reading. Same thing with seventh grade math. It's an indicator of success in future years to come. So we're taking a look at those, um, in that piece of information as well in terms of on track measures. Uh, yeah, I would add attendance, you know, you'll find some of these things were familiar and were existent in the school performance profile. Um, some of them they took with the change. Attendance is a good example of where uh, they changed the way that they measure it. Um, the, the attendance data that's reflected on the Future Ready Index site right now is actually 16, 17 data. Um, it, that, that will continue to be a two-year lag. So next year we know we've already put 1718 and it will be the 1718 days. Um, that was one of the things I, I think at least myself I, I, I found a little bit frustrating with this. Um, just based on the fact that we've already been graded on the 1617 data. Um, that happened. The other part, the part that I'm frustrated with is under the old method which we were graded, we fared far better for attendance at least at secondary level. Um, the new way that it's calculated um, it's basically the, the percentage of students that attend 90% or more of the school day. Um, we did not fare as well under that calculation. Um, those are things that, that you know, we've talked about and, and accepted and resolved to, to work on. And then the third major category is called career, college and career measures. Um, the first one, the career standards benchmark, really only applies to the elementary. The state is now requiring us to submit um, evidence that our students at the ends of grades 5, 8, and 11 have participated in career exploration opportunities. We've always participated in career exploration opportunities in this district. The state is now requiring schools and districts though to submit evidence that every student has had that type of an opportunity. So this last year was our first year where we had to actually collect evidence that our students did participate in those different kinds of career exploration. 
And the other ears are relatively new, so and they're pertaining to secondary. They're secondary. Um, graduation rate, there, there was a change. That, that was part of the old school performance profile. There's a change in how it's calculated now. Um, in, in the past platform, that was essentially the, the number of seniors that you started with in the school year, how many made it to the stage at the end of said school year. Um, now it's measured through cohort fashion, where you know, we start with ninth grade all the way through. How many make it from ninth grade through 12th grade into the stage? Um, Industry-based learning, that is essentially the percentage of kids that earn a certificate. Uh, an example might be, uh, you know, did, did they take a NOCTI test or a NIMS test, you know, in a, in a CTE program? Now, you know, obviously we're not going to fare very well in that, but we have access to Lenpivo Tech, so we don't maintain a lot of those kinds of CTE programs necessarily uh, at the high school. Uh, rigorous courses of study. Uh, that refers to the percentage of kids who have taken uh, a dual enrollment college course or an AP course or a student uh, who was enrolled in a uh, career in tech ed and CTE program. Um, Post-secondary transition to school, military, and work. That's more an, uh, just an emphasis to try to encourage us to keep tabs on kids after they leave us. Right. Um, this is for graduate student, graduate, graduated kids, 16 months out. Where are they? Have they gone to school? Have they gone to the military? Have they gone to work? And that begs the question: If you're not in one of those things, what are you doing? Um, so that's an attempt to measure that. I, I would add to some of those: the state still hasn't been able to kind of establish baselines and expectations for what the goals are going to be um, because they're still looking at some data. Um, we had actually some glitches in that regard uh, just based on because of the new school and some connections with the college board that, that we're working through also. Okay. Well, we're ready. Before the principals do begin, though, I would like to just um, thank them on our behalf. They're very dedicated. They work incredibly hard, um, working with staff, looking at the data trying to, each and every year, look at the data and increase student achievement across the board. So um, that being said, we'll move on to Dr. Barry. Good evening. Uh, I want to first of all thank you uh, for the opportunity to go first. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, second, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to really talk about our successes at West Hills Primary. Um, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I love what we do down there, and it starts with uh, 690 students in kindergarten through third grade, so we're talking about ages, what, five to eight years old, walking through the door every day, um, and about uh, 55 teachers, staff, cafeteria workers, custodians coming in every day and loving what they do to get to, to these scores up here. And even before we get to that, we have our kindergarten, first, second grade teachers working extra hard. Um, building the foundational skills for reading and math before we even get to our PSSAs. So, uh, you know, it, it all uh, starts with all those students walking through the door and the teachers working so hard. But our third grade PSSAs um, last year, um, we had 69 percent. I'm not sure where 1 percent comes in, but 69 percent of the students were proficient or advanced on PSSAs, which is uh, well above the state, and our math is the same. Um, you know, teachers, those third grade teachers take everything they've learned in K-1 and 2 and, and drive it home with PSSAs, working hard. Um, just a little bit about the, the plan, and this is a very, very small snippet of what we do, you know, in, in a day, in an hour, in a year with our students. But, uh, you know, our teachers are involved in professional learning communities. They're always coming together to, to talk about what we can do better. What can we change? What do we need to fix? Um, you know, what do we need to... Uh, you know, uh, uh, what do we align our Pennsylvania standards a little bit more? And we use that with the MTSS, which is multi-tiered systems of support. Everything is tiered, all of our instruction, all of our interventions, we tier them to meet the needs of all students. Um, we're implementing some STEM and STEAM activities this year, which is uh, real exciting for all the students. Um, and we continue to, you know, look at our grade level goals, look at our grade level data, um, you know, we track cohorts of students through that data. Um, even though it's a K to three, we don't have our, our PVOS data. We still track students. We still, you know, make sure we're, we're, we're meeting their needs and, you know, we monitor them through walkthroughs. Um, the positive behavior support uh, uh, program, which we've had for several years in our district, 
Um, you know, we've tried to enhance it a little bit. Uh, I know we have little ones coming through the door, but there's a lot of needs coming through that, those doors. You know, we have our two district-wide programs at West Hills Primary. Um, we have little ones if, if it's anxiety, ADHD, uh, trauma in the home. There's just a, a lot of needs uh, coming through the doors. So we've tried to enhance our positive behavior support team by supporting our staff climate, which is just as important as the students. We support the students as well. Um, and we've, tried, we've implemented some school-based therapy and uh, the Highmark Caring Place is kind of coming in a little bit to, to deal with some of the trauma that we have with our little ones. So um, that's, that's just as important as all the academics that are going on. But you know, I'm really proud of the students and the teachers at West Hills Primary. So, All right, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Dr. Cranebacher for West Hills Intermediate. Good evening. Thanks uh, again for the opportunity to, to share this evening. Um, similar to what Dr. Barry was saying, um, we have so many things going on at this campus. Many of them um, are, are sort of a, a partner approach because we share the same uh, families and siblings, um, and we have a lot of great things going on. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments uh, maybe a little bit uh, more narrow to the uh, uh, PSSA scores and achievement scores, growth scores that we have here this evening. So um, as you know, West Hills Intermediate is a grade four, five, six building. Um, and uh, we, I'm, uh, we have, uh, have our scores here. Uh, top bar is ELA, middle and math, and uh, fourth grade is tested in science, fifth and sixth is not. In all categories here, we have exceeded the state average. Um, we did uh, exceeded it most significantly in science. Uh, ELA, we were at 62%, 63, 63, uh, obviously quite similar across grade levels. And in math, we were at 46, 49, and uh, 48 in math. Uh, some of those went up, some uh, went down just slightly in uh, uh, one area or two. Um, our PVOS, again, which is um, our student growth measure, uh, we had significant growth. I was very proud of our growth, especially in uh, sixth grade math and ELA and in our fifth grade ELA. Uh, one identified area that we're going to focus on this year uh, is grade four math and reading and grade five math. So uh, the, all areas are going to get attention. Those are two, uh, three areas that we're going to uh, focused on most, most importantly. Uh, we have, a, as I shared earlier, we have a lot of things that we're doing. Um, I'm going to mention a few that um, uh, are most directly um, uh, relate to our scores. One of the first things that we did is uh, we changed our master schedule around this uh, a bit this year. We um, have been departmentalized, but we had teacher teaching partners, and we went to teaching triads this year. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, math teachers, ELA teachers, and science social studies teachers. And what this has allowed us to do is um, allow our teachers to focus on their content area, and then when we want to get together to talk about uh, curriculum assessment, instruction, pacing, those types of things. We have less teachers that we have to try to round up. It's a lot more efficient and uh, we, uh, you know, for the most part have all the right people in the right slots to, to handle that. Um, uh, this was one that we, we had on here last year also, but um, standards-based instruction, teaching what's necessary and with the uh, proper rigor. And in a sense, what we mean here is that we want to make sure that we're not just teaching stuff, but we we know precisely what is a uh, grade level standard and we know the rigor in which it needs to be taught. If it's a performance task or if the kids have to uh, create or produce or explain, that we provide them those opportunities to practice that at, at each grade level. Um, we sometimes refer to this as progressions of learning. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not just teaching what's next in a teacher's manual, but really understanding what is important at each grade level. Um, we will continue to have classroom focus plans where we're able to triangulate data. We have benchmarking data, um, study island data, PVOS, metric projection data, um, and we're really able to look at um, which kids are doing well, which ones are struggling, which ones were projected to perhaps not be proficient, and who has them, and how are they doing, and um, use some uh, you know, various uh, interventions along the way to um, improve their, their performance. And um, we really have a heavy instructional focus this year. Um, we've always had an instructional focus, but we really identified a couple areas that are 
most important to us. In ELA, we um, are focusing on an uh, uh, instructional technique called close reading, text annotation, and spending a lot of continued time on, on a performance task called text-dependent analysis. <coughs> Um, we're all required to do this. It's 25% of the PSSA test, and for the most part, it's one writing assignment the kids have to do. So it's really important we get it right. Um, we're doing a lot of independent reading and, and uh, journaling, trying to build reading stamina uh, and reading interest. In math, um, we have a uh, uh, unique partnership with um, Carnegie Learn Lab. They're working with uh, my building this year. Sixth grade is using a math software called Mathia, which has proven to be very effective. Um, we're looking at realigning the rigor, again, making sure that uh, we're not just doing uh, simple computational problems, but instead looking at application problems, story problems, multi-step um, uh, activities. And then in math, there's also, similar to the TDA, or text-dependent part, there is uh, math open-ended tasks, which comprise 23% of their tests. So again, they really need, we need to make sure that they um, can perform this task to be successful. And uh, recently, I, I added this here, uh, our CMU consultants were, were sharing that they uh, really emphasize something called math talk. It's a particular strategy where kids are really working in partnerships and verbalizing their um, math thinking, um, which is, is a, a little bit of an um, uh, alternate strategy to the traditional approach that we might have been using. So uh, these are a number of um, strategies that we're going to use for our instructional uh, focus this year. So. Thank you. And Mr. Hooks is next with Elderton and Lenape. Hello. Uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to present today. Um, I'm Chris Hooks. I'm the principal of Elderton and Lenape Elementary. Um, Elderton is a K to six building with roughly 225 kids, um, and Lenape is a building. Um, K to six with roughly 810 kids now. Um, so up here right now we have Elderton Elementary. Um, we've been pretty pretty uh, happy with the scores that we've gotten there. Um, you know, one area that we work is the math in third grade, but I feel very confident that w um, at the end of next year that we will be above um, when third grade moves into fourth grade that they we will certainly be above the state average in that. Um, we've been very successful there with the amount of growth that we showed when kids come in. Um, <coughs> from year to year, um, and the, our PVOS data has showed that. Um, as for Lenape Elementary, um, so if you take a look at some of the numbers there, there's some areas that we want to work in, um, but uh, when I take a look at our students' growth in those buildings, especially in mathematics, um, it's, it's, it's quite nice. Um, you know, our teachers are really working hard in those buildings to bring up those scores and get them to where we want them to be. Um, you know, you know, one area that we made some huge gains last year was fourth grade science, um, and you'll see we're well above there. Um, and our ELA scores uh, have definitely showed also. Um, as for some of the things that we're doing in those buildings, I kind of combined the two because we're doing a lot of things um, similar to raise those scores in curriculum instruction. We're aligning the curriculum through grade levels. Um, you know, a lot of times when we, we get, the teachers go through these curriculums, they kind of say, oh, you know what, I noticed uh, in third grade that in second grade maybe there were some skills that we need to, we need to, that they're, they're not quite getting. So we've given them time to meet with one another um, and to uh, make sure what the third grade teachers may need, need taught is being done with, with the second grade. So we're kind of streamlining that and making sure that the kids are coming into the next grade level um, with what they, what they need. Um, our after-school tutoring, we are targeting that to the, our highest need kids, okay? Uh, so in that way, we can give those kids extra help. Those kids that are on the bubble that we know could go either way. With the extra help, we want them to make sure that they're going in the right direction. Um, and we put a lot of focus this year on our STEAM lab. Um, we're happy to say that we will be, uh, at the beginning of the year, um, we will be opening um, the, a STEAM lab at Lenape Elementary. Um, so uh, where kids will be able to come in, work on, you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and we have the equipment ordered, and it's, and we're very, very excited about that. Um, professional development opportunities, um, oftentimes our in-services uh, focus around uh, teachers and some of the great things that they're doing in the building. Um, all of the principals 
uh, know that we have some teachers doing some outstanding things. So I think it's key that we get together and we share those opportunities and what we're doing because um, we have some great things. I know, for instance, um, I have some teachers that use a program called Study Island very, very effectively in mathematics. And it has showed through our PVOS data uh, to be bene very beneficial. Um, department meetings that focus on PVOS data, uh, like Dr. Solosky said and Dr. Williams, we focus on growth um, and moving kids um, more than a year is our goal, to get them so they're caught up to where they need to be. Um, and teachers sharing successful strategies, resources, websites, uh, and things like that. Uh, parent involvement, we have focused on bringing parents to the table with our ESS process um, and bringing them in and trying to get their support because ultimately when, when we're able to build that support with the parents, that's when we see the most significant change with our students. Um, and increase parent and teacher communication. Um, you know, we did a survey this year for Title I and they said kind of things that worked. Um, we got programs called Class Dojo and Remind App that we can reach out to these parents and easy communication with parents and parents like it uh, and many of our teachers are using it to distribute homework or just saying, hey, you did an awesome job, your kids did a great job and things like that. Um, now, Elderton, my assistant Manny Toy, actually applied for a grant this year, a $10,000 grant, and we were awarded it. I think West Hills, West Hills was also awarded it this year, uh, primary. The grant is on early literacy, K-1. to um, Team of administrators, teachers, and support staff attended a four-day intense conference, um, I believe in Harrisburg this year, um, focused on supporting all students. Um, at Elderton Elementary to achieve proficiency by third grade, according to the PSSAs, um, uh, using universal screening tools. So we're trying to make sure that the screening tools that we're doing are successful and they're guiding where we need kids and where we want kids to be, and continue to build a strong relationship with parents, preschool providers, and other community organizations that, that, to foster early reading skills. Um, you know, our goal now that we've, we've we're at Elderton with it. Uh, in the January uh, 21st uh, Professional Development Day, we're going to bring that. We're going to have Elderton and the um, Lenape teachers in K-1. to They're going to come together and want to share those strategies that were learned at that workshop so we can then bring it and lead it into Lenape. Um, so that's, that's pretty much our uh, Lenape and Elderton Elementary. I believe Dr. Giancola is next. I remember two years ago being up here and asking people, how do I pronounce his name? <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. I just want to talk about our scores at Dayton and Shannock Valley Elementary School. Um, I'd like to echo some of the things that Paula had said. You know, these things, we're looking at third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and beyond, but really it starts in kindergarten. A lot of our kids come into these two schools without any prior school experience. So a lot of them don't know how to sit in a chair. For instance, a lot of them don't know how to sit at the carpet. So our teachers do a great job in primary, especially because of the all-day kindergarten. I can't say enough about that, like I say every year when we come to this. It's a great program, and it really helps all of our kids get where they need to be. Um, my Dayton teachers did really well this year. I'm really happy. We're above the state average in every area. I'm especially happy with the third grade, 83%, um, 89%, well above the state average. Um, our scores, which I'll get to at Shannock, weren't as high in third grade. So I had those teachers that, from Dayton and Shannock kind of share ideas, especially how they were doing things at Dayton. So very happy, especially with the math. Um, so I think we're going in the right direction, high proficiency rates. We do work on PVO, you know, we look at PVO scores, but we really have to get every kid there along with getting them to grow. So those are our Dayton scores. Our Shannock Valley scores, um, we, have a newer we had a newer teacher in third grade, so we, you know, she wasn't quite up to snuff with this curriculum, but we're, we're doing things this year to bolster that. I mean, they're going to be through the roof this year um, in third grade. We also have some Title I support, extra Title I support in third grade that we didn't have last year. We have the Title I support five days a week there instead of three, which is great. Um, you know, so especially our math scores are really good across the board and our English language arts, um, sixth grade, you know, 76 percent proficient in advance. That's a lot. That's, that's really high. So some of the things we're doing in both of the schools. Um, my main goal, I can go ahead and move it, Chris, thanks. Um, my biggest thing, my SLO, my student learning objective is attendance. 
we need to get more kids to school. We're doing all these incredibly fantastic things in all of our rooms in, every, in both schools. But if kids aren't there, they're not going to get that instruction. And then when they miss, then they come back and they're trying to make up and they miss some things. So I'm really trying to focus. So this far, thus far this year, in uh, Shannock Valley, after the first nine weeks, if we continue the right work going on, we'll be 39% higher in attendance by the end of the year. At Dayton, 27% higher. Um, I'm doing all kind of things, and the teachers are, doing, teachers are encouraging kids. Teachers are plugging in, in their newsletters. I do robocalls at the end of the nine weeks. Thank you for sending your kids to school. Um, this is my third year. I think I've earned their trust, and you know, it takes a while to earn trust, and I think I have. And I think a lot of our parents in these two areas, they'll listen to what we say. They view us as the experts on school, so they'll listen. If you're a little sick, maybe you could come, and then if they're not feeling well, they could go home. Stomach issues, stay home, for sure. Don't come then. But, you know, I think some, it's just like work. You know, hey, maybe I can power through today. Maybe I need to stay home and rest. Obviously, I don't want really kids sick, uh, sick kids coming. So I'm really focusing on kids. One kid, if she comes all week, I buy her pizza, and then I get pizza too. So that's a that's a win-win there, and it's really working. I'm just talking to parents, developing a relationship with them. That's the biggest thing we're doing because I'm convinced if they're there, those numbers are going to keep going up. Um, another thing I'm excited about, um, and I talked to Cheryl about this um, last year, the departmentalization in grades four and five. So we have a, a really great math teacher, a great science teacher, a great ELA teacher. So they work with all those kids in fourth and fifth grade, and it's really going to work out well because uh, they have high P PVOS scores. They have high proficiency rates, so we're kind of capitalizing on people's strengths. Um, and then we talk about PVOS, every teacher that has PVOS numbers, you know, because every teacher could be different. Um, it's easy to, you know, it's a little difficult to say, okay, all fourth grade needs to go up. It's really more like, okay, the middle school, the middle kids in this teacher's class need to go up. The low kids in this teacher's class need to improve. So that's, those are the things we're focusing on. Also, our PBIS, especially at Shannock Valley, it's going really well in both schools. Referrals are way down. So again, if kids are there and they're behaving themselves, our scores will go up because of the fantastic things we're doing in the classroom. Um, and we're all actually applying to be recognized by the state at Shannock Valley for our PBIS program. So hopefully we'll be the first one recognized, the first, and I'm sure we'll all be recognized at some point. Any questions? All right, thank you. Next, I think we have Mr. Kaminos. I think I've stood before this board for the last three years and told you how unhappy I was with our overall scores in the Armstrong High School. Um, if you look on the far left, the, the ELA and science are coded with blue while the mathematics is in red. That blue is an indication that from PVOS it shows that we have made significant, uh, there's significant evidence that shows we exceeded one year's worth of growth. So we are trending in the right directions of where we want to be uh, moving forward. And mathematics, while we're hanging around those state averages with the exception of eighth grade math, I believe we've identified the proper areas that we need to focus on to improve those overall scores. Somewhat happy, but we know we can do better and we will continue to do better. And like I said, the hard work that the ELA and science teachers have already put in, we're now duplicating that in our, in our mathematics department. So in our areas of focus, just as Dr. Giancola said, we want to increase our student attendance. Dr. Williams mentioned that they changed the calculation on us. Uh, what we're doing now is through our ESS team, we are starting to really examine our students' attendance and their patterns. We're starting to see if a kid starts to miss a certain amount of days per nine weeks, we're contacting the parents, we're pulling the students in. What is it that you're not, what, what is it that we're not doing right that you're not coming to school? What is, are, are you sick? Make sure you're seeing a doctor. We're talking about their wellness. We're talking about their decision making and their overall motivation. And we're hoping that we see a, a decrease in our absenteeism overall with the work that we're doing with our SAP team and our ESS process. I mentioned about our improved mathematics performance data. We are heavily monitoring what's happening with our classroom assessments. We're trying to make sure our assessments are matching what the standards are asking for. I believe you heard that. Uh, in the elementary presentations as well, we're doing the same thing. If they're asking to analyze, we're making sure we're analyzing. We're not just identifying or calculating. We're going to those higher levels of understanding 
just as the standards are asking us for. The other nice thing is the elementary schools are doing such a great job. Those positive scores are starting to filter their way up. I believe that wave's probably hitting us right about now where there's no excuse that these kids have never experienced these standards before. These students are starting to grow up in there. So the expectation is that their success is going to start to become our success as well. Um, and the increased growth index number, that's happening a couple different ways. What we're doing is I'm having individual meetings with teachers uh, in order to discuss the, their instructional planning. What are you doing in the classroom? How are you grouping students? Uh, are you able to differentiate this lower group of students that have a low probability of success? What are you doing for them? Where on the opposite end, if you have these students with a high level achievement of success, what are you doing for them to help them continue to grow and, and, and gain another understanding? Middle group, same exact thing. Trying to differentiate that instruction, group students appropriately so that we're giving them the best service that we can give them. Um, and the last thing is in mathematics. We, we believe in benchmarking. Where are we at specific times of the year? The mathematic teachers this summer, when we saw our performance data, were not happy with their benchmark assessments. Totally revised them in the seventh and eighth grade levels. Uh, again, meeting those standards. Now we're making better educational decisions, instructional decisions with those students uh, with the idea of, again, improving that overall student achievement hopefully making us have a better predictor for how we're going to do in the future, as well as making sure we're hitting the right areas for, for increasing our student growth. Okay. Dr. Shutters? All right, what's your uh, Up there you'll see how we performed this year. Uh, ELA, mathematics, are in the red. Those are an indication that we did not meet our growth. Uh, some of that we, have, we think we found out some of our areas we're working on. Uh, in areas like ELA, uh, Chuck had mentioned the uh, text-dependent analysis. We reached out to the IU, and 25% of that test is that text-dependent text analysis. And across our entire IU, including us, we don't do very well, and it's something that's almost overlooked. So we've spent a lot of time with our 7th and 8th graders, our teachers, looking to uh, do better at that. He says our ELA, state average in 7th, slightly above in grade eight, uh, keystones slightly above, but we're not seeing the growth we want out of these kids. So we're putting a lot of emphasis this year on getting that, those uh, kids heading in the right direction. Uh, especially in grade seven, where out of the two we're the weaker of the areas, we're, as far as we're relaxing the kids, we're making sure when they're reading books, they're reading the right level of books. Because even though it may be on a grade level uh, their grade level, they might already be reading at an eighth grade or ninth grade level. So we're trying to make sure they're getting challenging books to make sure they move on. So that red, even though they're being proficient, they're actually growing like, like we want them to. Uh, I tell our kids every year, because they always start to sweat the uh, test at the end of the year, as I'm sure you did, as we go through this. Uh, you hang with us, we'll get you out. Uh, the state continues to say they're going to put the requirement in for graduation. They keep putting back every year the moratorium. Uh, but as you can see with us, uh, we're almost at 90% on two of those subject areas. So our kids work real hard from the time they get in till they get out uh, to make that progress, and they're doing a decent job. But like we said, in growth and mathematics, it's the same way. Uh, actually, eighth grade uh, was slightly up. Seventh grade was slightly down. Excuse me, it was actually vice versa. Uh, we're going through the whole process, and we are rewriting our curriculum to match up to make sure we know what we're doing. To, so we're hitting that rigorous content. So right now our math 7th and 8th grade teachers are redoing our maps as they go through, updating me on about a, every month or two basis, and we're trying to make sure we fill in all of our holes. Uh, science, we continue to grow. Our biology is doing uh, fairly well. 8th grade is holding its own. It's slightly up. Uh, but overall, that's where we are for right now. Chris? Uh, some of the things we do, uh, of course, you know, we've heard this before, we all do our summer data meetings. Uh, the assessments we're continuing to look at with Dr. Williams to redo those to make sure those are accurate and reflect what they're going to see in the test. Uh, right now, all of our math teachers have to turn in their test to me, and I match it up with the sample versions we get from the state, and are these really what the kids are going to see? Uh, I believe we teach the math. I don't know if we teach them how to always get into those real hard word problems, for lack of a better term. Uh, so we're looking at those, redoing that. 
Uh, we place our kids based on several criteria. We try to group them into their abilities and so our teachers can less differentiate. Uh, of course, we have PVOS meetings with all of our teachers. We go over all their data. They are given the projections for next year through our uh, computer system, and then they can work with those kids from there. Uh, and like I said, the last thing is the realignment. Which I talked about math. Uh, ELA also went through this year, and they went through over the summer and made more adjustments based on what they'd seen on their data. And after we talked to the IU and saw that not only is it a problem for us, but it was a problem for the state. It was staggering the TDA, what, what our kids in the state don't do. And if we're missing, and the rest of the state's missing 25% of the test, if we can nail some of that down, that'll help us tremendously. Questions? Uh, <clears throat> some of the data that we presented here, if you go out to the Future Ready Index, you won't necessarily see it broken out by grade. I asked the principals to do that just to give kind of a more detailed picture. Um, what you'll find at the Future Ready Index is basically a composite for the school, meaning all, all the grades are combined in the, the one. If anybody's interested, I, I would be happy to, to meet with anyone and go through any or, any or all of this. Thank you. Higher question. Yes, sir. Is this the first year of the PSSA? different didn't they revise their test it, it was revised in in 2000 2016 i believe for 15 with the switch to the common core the actual test was revised yes okay and from each administrator would an extra boost in the tutoring program benefit our students I think any, any boost would help, but I mean, at this point, we have tutoring at, at the prime, at the elementary anyway. Two days a week, we do reading and math. Um, so at the elementary level, I think the tutoring is working for us with what we have at this point. All right, thank you. We provide time within our seminar periods for that type of thing as well. A lot of our students do have issues with getting home after school, for an after school tutoring session lack of transportation, families not being home. Uh, so we try to provide them some things in school as well. Uh, to kind of give them that extra support and kick that they need. But my two schools, a lot of the teachers can just do, you know, we do have the tutoring program, but then the teachers are so good, they know where kids are struggling, and they can just kind of work with those kids right in the right in the classroom, you know, differentiate instruction. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, we are ready to move on here. Uh, do we have any public comments on agenda mm -hmm. items? Not seeing any. That brings us to the presentation of the regular monthly agenda. And I believe the first thing we need to look at are the minutes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we have the minutes for the open caucus session of November 1st, 2018 and the regular meeting of November 5th, 2018. Uh, Everyone approved to put those on? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, bills, we have the Food Service Fund, Capital Projects Fund, Athletic Fund, and presentation of bills for payment of November 2018. Do we have approval to put those on the agenda? Yes. yes. Okay. Under education, we have the addition of courses for 2019-2020, dual enrollment agreement with Pennsylvania State University, New Kensington campus, 
and ed 3 2018-19 student transfer requests uh, do we have anything to elaborate on there on education uh, the Penn State New Kent agreements an agreement that we've had with them in the past um, the, the course addition is for a course called ancient civilization which was born out of student interest and uh, there is a social studies teacher at each of the secondary schools kind of combined for that curriculum map so it's something we'd like to try to run and, and uh, be able to offer students if, if the interest is there okay do we have agreement to place those on the agenda for monday yes 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 okay uh under business uh, business one yeah, go ahead. Um, business one is just a uh, looking for approval to create a science club at Armstrong Junior Senior High School. Two and three are standard that we do each year, authorizing us to advertise for supplies and uniforms for the upcoming school year, as well as participating in the uh, various cooperative purchasing programs for the uh, 2019 calendar year. Business four, we've been talking about this for a while. We were waiting till we were done utilizing the field up at the Florida City. You know, or football stadium track uh, since we are done with that it's our recommendation to lease it to the Ford City Youth Football Program um, for a 10-year period of time uh, for a dollar they will assume all uh, maintenance of that facility as well as the utilities um, they will be letting other organizations use the baseball side of it uh, various things that they've done in the past or the relay for life that's good to continue to happen I've told them we'd like them to keep it open, the track for the community to use. So um, I did meet with them last week. Mr. Hartman and their group is very uh, receptive to uh, keeping that open for public use and other organizations throughout the Fort City community. And um, lastly, proposal for uh, some new track and field equipment at Armstrong Junior Science High School with the um, addition of the track up there uh, the proposals for twenty thousand dollars this money was budgeted it's with mf athletic uh, incorporated and this is being purchased uh, through the buy board cooperative purchasing program and, uh, and one other item um budget transfers business six used to be up under the reports uh this actually should be the item it should be board approved monthly we were presented to you as information so just moving it down on the reports to the business part of the agenda. Any questions on those items? Okay, not seeing any questions. Do we have what, a, a, why just 20 <laughs> hurdles? <coughs> We're going to reuse some of the hurdles we already have. They're in good shape. We might get rid of them. All right, so this well, is more. We want to make sure we have enough hurdles to cover all six lanes. Now. Right, so this is more or less replacing some of the old ones and have Replacing it. it it, it, when we were at Four Cities Track for one event in particular, the 300 hurdles, we only used three lanes. Uh, now we'll be able to use all six lanes, make our run a little more effectively, be able to have bigger events. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? We have approval to put on business one through business six yes. Monday? Yes. Yeah. I could touch on the next ones also. Okay, thank you. M1 and M2 are uh, both a request for Sunday use of facilities, which typically uh, requires board action based on our policy. The first one, M1, is with the uh, Armstrong Junior Senior High School marching band and wants to hold a twirling competition at uh, Armstrong Junior Senior High School. And M2 is a request uh, from the Armstrong Elite uh, Passport Softball Program to utilize Ellerton High School gymnasium batting cages for some of their uh, off-season workouts. M3, um, proposal recondition the gymnasium floor at Lenape Elementary. That again was a, a budgeted item. We, uh, we did get a couple different uh, quotes. Uh, we are using the Coast Star Pershing program though, and we feel comfortable with going with Sport Floors Incorporated at a price of 35,928. I know Mr. Hooks um, and working with his phys ed staff as well as the head custodian you know, looked at this thoroughly and this is the recommendation uh, as well as another lines everything they want to put on it so um, again it was it was a budgeted item in the budget 
M4, disposal of the food uh, service truck. Uh, it was a box truck that's been around for a very long time. We're really not delivering food anymore. It would not pass inspection. It's been sitting up at our, I think the last we used it was, I think last football season, two football seasons ago, I think we were uh, taking some equipment in it. But my understanding it won't pass inspection. Tailgate's not working. Um, it's a recommendation just to scrap it. I think, I can't remember what they said we'll get per time, but. Um, what was it? Eight bucks, a hundred. Eight, bu eight bucks, a hundred pounds, or something like that. Yeah. So that, our recommendation is dispose of it that way. And lastly, um, the mold testing and remediation report. As you know, beginning the school year, we had some issues with mold, mostly at West Shemokin. Um, throughout the process, we kept kept you up to speed and you know let you know what was going on. We said it was going to be a costly endeavor, and it was. Um, the total cost. Uh, from Reynolds Restoration Service, that's kind of came in remediate and got rid of the mold and cleaned the building, was $179,180. Um, and then we had Skelly and Loy, who does a lot of our asbestos testing. They're the ones that are coming in and taking the samples, taking it to the lab, testing for the mold. Their uh, cost was $28,015. So overall, it's $207,195. Obviously, this was not an item that was budgeted. We did have a $200,000 budgetary reserve line item in our budget for emergencies, and um, we do a budget transfer to transfer from that line item into to cover these costs for mediation and testing. <clears throat> and during that process, we did test all other buildings as well, and that's part of that $28,000. So we were proactive there without finding any evidence in other buildings. We did go out and test just to, in case there's any questions from the public as to what we're doing with other buildings, we did do some testing there. And that price is all included here. Any questions on that section of the agenda? On uh, maintenance to the Sunday usage of Elderton, is that organization a nonprofit? Yes. Okay. It's not aligned with the school, though, is it? It's not connected to the district in any way. Just the players. All right. <laughs> okay. Now, they are responsible for liability insurance now, is that they correct? They provide a certificate of insurance naming us additional insured, yes. Okay. Any outside organization is required right, to do that. Right, not connected with the school district. Yeah. A lot of times the youth programs that are not for profit, we do waive any fees associated with that. We've done that in the past with others, but we do require them to provide the certificate of insurance. Okay. Now, there's a stipulation, I think, that a school representative has to be in the building at all times. Is that correct? In this, in this, we have not required that. Excuse me. We have not required that. Well, that's not required then. We have we have not been requiring that in some of our buildings, particularly Catania High School. The last couple of years has been utilized a lot in the off season by youth groups and travel teams, and we weren't requiring a. We not rehire. Okay, we don't have a a custodian there. Well, a school rare uh, this. Policy says they want a school representative or custodian. And my question is, are we doing that? I know we've done it uh, whenever groups ask to use the cafeteria, we'll send one of our cafeteria employees to make sure that the equipment is run in the correct manner. Beyond that, if it's the auditorium it. where we're using some of our electronic equipment or that type of stuff, but to go in, into a gym, we have not required. <clears throat> okay. Can I ask a question as to why we're doing it on a Sunday instead of, say, a Saturday? I mean, that's their request. And I'm <laughs> yeah. Uh, so availability of coaches, they do it on Sunday. Um, Saturday, a lot of Saturdays they have, like, they have uh, indoor games and stuff through the winter. Okay. I'll ask the same question about M1 then. Why are we having that on a Sunday? Well, based upon a request, you said there's nothing but uh, basketball practices going on in there. I talked to the principal today. Maybe the principal's here. Maybe Jim can comment on himself. Uh, yeah, the two uh, boys and girls basketball practice at the same time that day from 8 to 10, I believe. And there was no discussion in regard to the Our basketball here. programs uh, practice 8 to 10. They switch gyms every week. They have a big gym and a small That's gym. Right. That gives more accessibility. That gym is available from 10 o'clock on. Right. Uh, 
Yellowstone with wide open on Saturday in question. We'll reach out to the requesting group and see if there's. Uh, that requesting group's never talked to me. Their request stated Sunday. Is that? Yeah. The, yes. The, yeah, the request stated Sunday. Because but due to. Because of basketball. Yeah. I don't know who they talked to, and I'll, I'll find that out. But uh, they never spoke to me. We prefer Saturday if possible. And that's why our practices are over at 10 o'clock. But we got to support our teams and that we want to keep our teams away from Sunday as much as possible. Then I use Sunday when we have bad weather, cancellations, or maybe a big game on Monday. According to PIAA rules, they have to take one day off a week. So most of the time, Sunday is a day for our kids to use. That, that's, that's a family thing. Why couldn't you use girls 8 to 10 in the small gym and the boys after this in the small gym? That would clear up your big gym for, for Saturday. Would it not? It would, but I, I think uh, our plan, we used to go 8 to 12 in the big gym is what we used to do. This year to free up more time, plus the coaches, the kids, that they want to get in there and they want to get their practice done. So I, I think 10 o'clock the rest of the morning, all afternoon and into the evening is ample time for any type of event. So I think we're being, because we encourage our, like Mr. Kirk said, I mean, we encourage these outside groups and we, we take care of them. We want our people using our facilities. And, and not to speak, a lot for Jim, but it, basketball is in season, yep. and they should have first priority for the gym, I would assume. Absolutely. And getting out of there by 10 a.m. does free it up for the rest of the day. And and the they have a wrestling room there? Or? Well, they have their own wrestling room, yeah. Wrestling has their own. Yeah, that's separate. <clears throat> uh, we used the Armstrong uh, high school softball field for practices on Sundays as well. So now we just want to move it to Alderton High School. I the think the policy room. covers outside different than it covers inside. In fact, I know the policy covers inside different. Okay, thank you. Okay, do I have approval to put uh, maintenance M1 through M5 on the agenda for Monday? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. I have approval for that. Uh, brings us to construction. We'll once again try to get the change order approved uh, for Armstrong Junior Senior High School. Uh, that was with Ms. Um And I'll just touch on the two transportations. Uh, approved for bus drivers, which is typically is something we do monthly, depending on if there's you know, new hires. And we'll try again to get the contracts approved for the 18-19 school year. Okay, do I have uh, consensus to put uh, construction C1 on the agenda for Monday. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think that is consensus. Uh, student transportation services. Do I have approval for <coughs> STS one and STS two? Go on the agenda for Monday. Yes. Yes. Okay. We also have approval there. <clears throat> Brings us to policy. Policy one. Amend policy number three twenty nine. Comments? Or, okay. Do I have approval to put that on the agenda? Yes. Okay. Have approval for that. And I believe that is the entire agenda. So going back uh, to our caucus agenda, uh, I believe we are at other informational folder? Do we yeah, have anything some, else? Yeah, there's some information in your information for the cost analysis regarding the junior high programs that uh, Mr. Rummel talked about this evening. Uh, the athletic report for the fall, Olympia Vote Tech, and credit back to district report is in there, along with uh, two proposals or three proposals on how to take care of the electrical project over there. And then there's some uh, dates regarding course of band all day concerts and there's some positive articles regarding the district there for your review. Yeah. Do you have any questions on any of those? 
not, then I believe we are ready for motion to adjourn. Well, oh, I had a couple of things under other I want to bring up. Uh, got an article about the rifle team the other day. I don't think they were able to get all their, I mean, it's a good article and stuff, but they didn't get as many rifles as they thought they could. I mean, uh, they didn't get funded like my understanding was they were enough, and I didn't know if we could look at buying a few more rifles or something like that. I know we voted on that earlier on that the, Maybe you can help with that, Jim. I mean, yeah, they, they have come up short on that. I think they're getting enough. They're, they were just at the Elks the other night. I believe that. But they, it's been a struggle. I, I guess the, they didn't get as much as you stated in that. So rifles are very expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I know they are. And I don't know if we can look into providing maybe a few rifles. I, I don't know. Just what would the cost of those rifles? I think about twenty uh, thousand is working. Twenty two hundred bucks. Two grand. That's what I understood. Two grand. Is he able to compete with what he what they have, or you know exactly what needs they have, or not really? Uh, he, the coach hasn't contacted me. I just heard that through an article, and also uh, one of my employees was on their posters. So that's how I know that information. The coach has never came to me with any needs or anything. Yeah. So uh, I'll reach out to him. I'll reach out to them and see if there is a need and then do they have enough to actually compete. Okay. Yeah, and, and the last thing uh, that I wanted to bring up, uh, I'm going to talk about for a couple of years now, the, the, some improvements at uh, West Shemokin um, with storage in a field house. And, and I, I'd like to uh, start uh, thinking about that um, project. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Sutters is here. Uh, I actually have a meeting scheduled with Mr. Blystone next Wednesday. We talked a little bit about it. We had an athletic meeting what, last week or the week before. Started to talk about getting the ball rolling on that. Um, myself and the football coach, Dr. Williams, wants to come out Wednesday. I'm going to set this up this afternoon to start rolling and talking about that. Great. Great. I, I, I think we need to look hard at that. See if we get those improvements done out there. I know that I saw protests are still in the hallway. Yeah. yeah, they're still in the hallway. I mean, I think that's. A, a but I think they've been in the hallway since 2000 when I was a principal there. Right, right. I think it's about time we stood up and took care of that situation. Yeah, there's, you know, that between obviously what we need to do at Dayton and, and depending on what road we go there, um, I think we want to do at uh, West Smoke and. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be our recommendation not to do a bond issue this year to cover that stuff. But that being said, that means you're taking from your fund balance. So we've done a good job of increasing our fund balance over the last four years from the $6 million up to over <coughs> 11. But we just don't take $5 million out of the fund balance again. We're back down to where we were. So right. we've got to be careful with what we're doing. we got to be smart about it. we got time what we're doing when we're doing it. Um, I think the first thing we need to obviously need to address I think, is Dayton. I think we'll then take care of most of our educational facilities for now. Until there's some other stuff we got to look at, and then start looking at the West Shemokin as well. We're going to start seeing what we want to put into that building, and then get some schematics, drawings, and get some estimates. Um, I mean, I think everybody's content with we'll do some type of pool building, similar to what we did up at Armstrong, um, and what we put on that one side of it. Or I think there's we're limited on the amount of space we have there. What we put it at. Right. I know we want to address the needs of our our student athletes first. Um, Get the weight room back in there so we can open up that space. Start those talks. Okay. Good. Anything else? Now we should be ready for a motion to adjourn. So good. Okay, Mr. Mulroy. Second by. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, adjourn. <coughs>